given how often it's trotted out, you wonder if we've become a little too comfortable with the Ninth Symphony. Has it lost its power to shock us through all these pre predictable routines? And we could, therefore, in the process, be missing what's truly radical and revolutionary about this piece. Think of those the four movements, how they're so different from one another and yet conceived in a single arc as a trajectory pointing towards the setting of Schiller's Ode to Joy. And also how, in a sense, this is the secular twin of his Misa Solemnis, that great work written just a couple of years before. And both works are, in a sense, hymns to the power of music. I mean, this is music about music in all its diversity. And I feel that in the Ninth Symphony, Beethoven is putting aside his demons and all his pain and really letting himself loose in the sheer joy of music making and then goes on to impart that joy to all of us for eternity. The three opening movements form a trajectory towards his choral setting of Schiller's Ode. It's a poem that had captured his imagination 30 years before. And throughout the journey of the ninth, he plants little seeds of that theme that's going to come to fruition later on in the finale. Ein Freude schöner Götter Funken, Tochter aus Elysium. And the mysterious opening bars reveals to us a type of primeval landscape out of which gradually there emerges structure and order and shape as he brings in instruments one by one. Splintered fragments ricocheting around the orchestra, strings to winds, back and forth, in defiant combat. And here in the woodwinds is the first premonition of the Freude, or joy, theme of the last movement. If you've been following these introductions to the Ninth Symphonies, you'll have noticed how playing them on the period instruments of the Orchestre Révolutionnaire et Romantique is a quite deliberate bid to recreate the sound of Beethoven's imaginary orchestra, the orchestra that he never actually could hear himself, and how these instruments bring greater individuality of timbre, greater transparency, much more dynamic energy and rhetorical impact. It's as though each of them is, is, is speaking a, a personal line in, in a drama, which is so valuable in bringing out all the rhetoric in Beethoven's conception of the symphony. I mean, just listen to the way the natural horns have to hold that pedal E natural, and in order to achieve the F natural that he writes, they have to insert their hands in the bell of the instrument and use their embouchure to squeeze out that sound and to bring out its full pathos. And it's something that it's not easy to reproduce in a modern orchestra. Here comes a moment of incredible excitement and white-hot radicalism, and Beethoven galvanizes his whole orchestra into a stampede hurtling towards a brick wall at full speed. And what began as a misty shroud has by now developed into a colossal apocalyptic roar. <laughs>
challenge for Beethoven here in this huge trajectory that he's begun is to make sure that the first movement isn't an end in itself, that it's part of a colossal four-movement symphony. And he has to keep his eyes on the distant horizon and to make sure that he maintains the momentum and the ongoing tension. And I think that's the reason why the coda begins in such an eerie world, like a funeral procession. It starts in the brass and woodwinds and it's over a chromatic motif repeated seven times in the low strings and then it moves upwards to engulf the entire orchestra. And that's what brings this epic movement to a close. The second movement is marked molto vivace, but this is no light-hearted scherzo. The music blows up in your face. Only now does he start a light-footed fugue, and soon we realize that he's building on his seventh symphony scherzo in the insistent rhythmic propulsion and sense of thumping, backing, frenzy, but it's double its length. It's as though he needs to balance that epic first movement and give it equivalent weight and substance here. Listen to the way those urgent dactylic rhythms now seem to soften and melt under the canopy of the sustained woodwinds, who then abruptly turn up the dial and switch to a full pelt swagger. For the development section, Beethoven switches from irregular four-bar groupings to three-bar units. Well, you'd expect a conductor to notice that. And then he trains his beam of light on the kettle drums. Now, these are not just woofy, rotund support for the bass line, nor just a military adjunct to the brass instruments. Beethoven is determined that we notice the timpanist here as a soloist in his own right, playing with hard wooden sticks battering on tight calfskin drum heads. A close look at the autograph score reveals that the accents that every timpanist usually plays on every downbeat here is actually a chain of diminuendos. And it's a sign that Beethoven is using his drummer as a kind of master of ceremonies, choosing whether to chide the woodwinds for being so timorous or to quell the onrush of the revelers. Later on, he has to play like a wild dervish. Another extraordinary moment in this movement is the way that Beethoven engineers a transformative acceleration into his trio section. It's almost a sort of magic trick, getting faster in order to end up getting slower. To me, this trio section suggests that he's 
anticipating the Zeit umschlungen Millionen, uh, be embraced, ye millions, of the last movement that's still to come. Especially the folksy theme in the horns and the way it dissolves into a, a kind of village band led by a, a humble accordion. Out of this comes a slow movement. It's a sort of island of repose after the maelstrom and all that tonal storm music that has dominated up to this point. Beethoven opens up with the bassoons and the clarinet, gently drawing back the curtains as if to reveal and to console a convalescent patient recovering from the battering of those first two movements. This adagio molto, he specifically marks cantabile, singing, as if to remind us that melody must always be given priority above all else, as he once wrote. Beethoven's often criticized, compared to Schubert, say, for his fragmented, sometimes austere use of melody. Well, not here. It just pours out seamlessly. In alternating two glorious spun out themes, Beethoven offers us different visions of the future and guides us to move from one to the other by meticulous gradations from piano to più piano, pianissimo. Many people have said that they feel that this is the passage in the Ninth Symphony where they feel Beethoven is addressing them personally with thoughts that, as Wordsworth said, just at the same time, do often lie too deep for tears. Here is one passage of quite extraordinary otherworldly beauty. There's no other orchestral sound I've ever come across quite like it, and it's more like chamber music than orchestral music. And Beethoven is charting utterly new orchestral terrain here. It starts with a solo clarinet on top of three other woodwinds and pizzicato strings, spinning out the opening theme. And then, almost imperceptibly, the fourth horn emerges as the leading voice, and he has to encompass two and a bit octaves. It's a daunting challenge for any player, and it demands complete mastery of hand-stopping skills. Well, just listen to the way that Joe Walters rides the waves here. Thank you. 
And now comes a brand new soundscape as the fourth horn hands over to the first violins who now soar up into the stratosphere with roulades of pure silk from whence they must play like gods to do justice to Beethoven's vision. If the patient was convalescent at the start of this movement, well, he or she is restored to full health and wholeness. The finale opening shatters that piece. Wagner described it as a terror fanfare. And we're back to the tumult and despair of the first movement, only this time with added klaxons. It reminds me of a traffic jam in Paris of angry taxi drivers leaning on their car horns during Russia. <laughs> You're about to hear the whole of this finale from our Barcelona performance uninterrupted. But just a few pointers beforehand. Beethoven had persistent misgivings about this choral conclusion, and he even drafted ideas for a purely instrumental finale. Well, he didn't actually need to add singers for this movement. I mean, when you think that he's already got his instruments to speak, and as we've seen, he gives them wonderful lines to sing in the slow movement. So, totally logically, at the start of this movement, he gives the cellos and basses recitatives. They could have been straight out of an opera. And then comes the most revolutionary structural innovation of the, of the entire symphony, as Beethoven reviews fragments of the three earlier movements and rejects them one by one. <laughs> So here's the text that we find in the sketchbooks. After the first movement excerpt, Beethoven comments, no, this reminds us of our despair. And then after a snippet from the sketch, so nor this either, something more beautiful and better. And then after the third movement, quote, nor this, too tender. We must seek for something more animated. And finally, after a bit of the Freude theme, ha, this is it. Now it is found, I myself will intone it. And so here it is at last. A simple tune anyone could sing or whistle, starting as a soft murmur, and then from a collective humming, it burgeons out into a euphoric statement for the full orchestra. It's like a choir in full sail, and yet so far without a single singer. To criticise Beethoven for repeating the whole thing up to this point again, this time with singers, I think misses the essential point. For it's just not an accident, it's not a, a misjudgment. He needs to get up ahead of steam before he can unleash his voices. And it's first a bass soloist who acts as some sort of secular priest calling on his followers to spell out Schiller's message of hope to all mankind, as though blasting it from the rooftops or through a massive loud hailer. The most poignant and visionary passage in the whole of the finale is the slow mystical section towards the end where Beethoven floats his sopranos up to a high G pianissimo and leaves them there to impart his great dream and hope of 
Über Sternen muss er wohnen. Up above the stars, he must dwell. The Creator. And that note of optimism, it's the place where Beethoven bears his beating heart, generous and almost desperate to share it with everyone on the planet and to embrace the millions of us for all eternity.
Let's go. 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 Let's go.